Like so much. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, more instant messaging interoperability working group, the Mimi working group. Um, we're going to get started. So stop working on your slides. Um, actually, Matthew, do you mind closing the door right there? Thank you. So hopefully everyone is in the right place. Not as crowded as MLS. I don't know why we got a bigger room. Um, you can spread out. <laughs> so this is the note well. Hopefully you've seen it already this week. Um, this includes all the policies that govern the um, activities that we have here today, including our IPR policy, uh, code of conduct, and a variety of other things. Um, please treat each other respectfully. We've been a pretty convivial group in the past, so hopefully that will continue. We have a note taker. Thank you so much. Uh, Thomas has already agreed to take notes, um, and those will be on notes.ietf.org, so people can follow along and um, add things if you want to. Thank you. Chris? No, OK. <laughs> so we have two sessions here at uh, ITF 118. Today is the first one, and here's our agenda for today. Um, We'll have a brief update from Richard, I hope, if he's online, um, on the Mimi architecture, and then uh, Rowan for content format. And then we have a big chunk of time to talk about the Mimi protocol and hear from the design team about what they've been up to. Um, and we have spillover time tomorrow for that as well, in case we don't get through it all. Um, would anybody like to bash the agenda? Nope. OK, then I think we can turn it over to Richard. Good morning, everyone. The first slot of the day is always fun, especially when you're six time zones to the West. Don't worry, I have coffee. <laughs> so this is um, largely just a recap of what we've been talking about in the interims uh, for folks uh, who might be at the IETF without having been at uh, the intervening interim meetings. And Alyssa, am I driving this or are you driving this? Up to you. Um, I'm happy to drive. I feel, uh, sure, we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is a recap. Um, so those who are at the interims can kind of, you know, nod off uh, until the last couple of slides, which, which are just refreshed um, and have the latest data. So this is our, our client server to server to server to server to client. Uh, architecture. I think I may have had one too many servers in there, but um, anyway, the idea is that uh, service providers are represented by servers in this system and everything clients do in the system is intermediate by servers. Um, servers work together to create a room and rooms um, have events uh, that make them up. Next slide, please. Um, an important invariant at the transport level, at least, is that all when we have a room going, all the communications go via the hub for the room. There's a designated hub server for the room, which where the room is, is, is homed, and everything goes through that room, even stuff that might logically be uh, between uh, so two uh, non-hub servers in the room, like uh, fetching a key package. Um, this is just to, to simplify uh, some, thinking about some of the communication patterns. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things we, we wrangled about a little bit uh, uh, over the course since the last ITF meeting was the discussion of terminology, um, especially uh, what, a, what a member is. Um, where we settled is um, so we have kind of parallel terminology for users and clients. Um, so users we call participants in a room. User as a participant if they have some relationship with the room. So if they um, are present in the room and have some, some rights to, to interact with the room. Um, Clients in parallel are members of the end-to-end -end security state of, of the MLS group uh, corresponding to the room. So, so we have that, that kind of parallelism. Users are participants in a room. Clients are members in the uh, security state of the room. Um, now that obviously brings up the, the, the question of whether you can be a member with no 
different Mineo clients. Um, and so we have this active versus inactive terminology to go with this. So that you can, you if you are a user that has a participant that has clients uh, joined as members, uh, then we call you active, otherwise you're, you're inactive. Next slide, please. You're not gonna talk about the policy envelope? <laughs> Oh, sure. That's um, <laughs> thank you for keeping me on the on track. Um, uh, yeah, this this notion of policy envelope is, is still still important. Um, you may recall the last IETF meeting we we established this invariant that um, the the hub uh, server dictates the policy envelope, and uh, clients and servers within the meeting, participants uh, in the meeting or in the room. Sorry. Uh, dict uh, def define the specific policy. So you know. The, the envelope will define things like which uh, authorization policies are acceptable, and then uh, the clients and participating uh, users in the room will define uh, who exactly has, uh, you know, who exactly are the participants, who exactly has which rights in the room. Um, I think we are still working on you know, nailing down exactly how you describe that policy envelope, um, but um, it's definitely still a concept. We just need to, to flesh out more detail. Next slide, please. This is just an illustration of what I said on the last slide. We basically have three notions of state uh, within the state of the room. Um, we have an MLS group uh, that defines the most precise notion of state. So this defines the specific physical clients that have access to the secrets and the physical ability to use those secrets to participate in the in the MLS group and thus to, to, to do a lot of the, the things that we'll, we'll talk about doing in the room. Uh, we have a participant list that describes the users uh, that are active, that, that are participants in the room. Um, I think we, we generally assume that there's a, a clear mapping between the clients uh, who are in the in the in the MLS group uh, and the users who are participants. So it's clear which uh, clients belong to which users. Uh, you can see that user three there is inactive; it has no clients joined. And finally, on the left, we have an authorization policy that guides all of this. Um, so we have some notion of um, what the capabilities are of each user in the participant list, um, what what joins and uh, and removes are, are allowed for following some admission policy, et cetera. Next slide, please. Now, this this framework um, give. To, to keep this framework coherent as the group changes, as people join and leave, and as clients join and leave, uh, you need a, a, a kind of a, a notion of preemption uh, to, to dictate you know, what operations are allowed as things change. So we have two stages here to this, this preemption rule. First one is that a user can be a participant only if it's permitted by the authorization policy. And the second one is that a client can only join the MLS group if its owner is a user of the, uh, is a, if its owning user is a participant of the room. Next slide. So those um, those preemption rules impose some uh, constraints on how operations need to work. So if you're adding someone to the room, you need to add them to the participant list before any of their clients can be added when they're being removed. All their clients need to be removed from the MLS group before. Uh, they can be removed from the participant list. Um, so we will um, we'll end up dealing with that in the protocol. Um, I haven't seen Conrad and Matt and, uh, and Travis's slides, but I assume that they articulate something that's consistent with the invariant. Um, following that, though, we also have this notion of confirmation. Um, so, right, MLS operations are the were kind of the the, the finest grain notion of that state. Um, thank you, Apple, for helping with the thumbs up there, uh, giving a little positivity this morning. Um, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> MLS group, like I said, encodes the most fine grain state, but that needs to be consistent with everything at the higher layers. Um, so, so we have this kind of rotating thing where we make changes to the higher layers and they get reflected in the MLS group. Um, and then the MLS group, because it's kind of a hash chain, MLS is shaped kind of like a blockchain in the middle, um, gives us this, this nice causal thing we can put uh, changes to the group in to make sure that everyone, in, all of the clients in the group have the same representation of the group state. So because of this, this preemption invariant, the MLS state will sometimes um, uh, 
trail the um, you know what may have been done in higher layers, but the idea is that we'll take things that have been done in the higher layer and reflect them in the MLS state so that um, they can kind of confirm the blue area, the blue areas represent confirmation, um, those state representations in the higher layers. Ecker, yeah, I think you, you complained about this slide in the interim. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what you just said made a lot of sense to me, but I think I want to see if I can clarify um, you know, a point you made earlier, which is you said that someone can't be removed from a discipline unless they've been removed from the MLS state, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so imagine the following, hypo following hypothetical. We are in a, um, you know, we are in a work, we are in a, uh, uh, a chat together, a room, to room together, and I do something that violates the terms of service of, of the uh, of, of the chat service, right? So they want to evict me from every chat. They're, they're, they're basically closing my account and they want to evict every chat, right? Obviously, I, my client is not going to remove themselves from the MLS group. So how does that happen? Yeah, so so I think that there is. There is this. This is a, a, a point that we're we're still working out a little bit. Um, but I think the the idea we have is that um, the servers, uh, the, the state that the servers apply may run a little bit ahead of the state that is confirmed in the MLS group. Um, so the servers, um, you know, when the user is banned according in accordance with the authorization policy, um, may have a state that is. Um, you know, the, that reflects the user no longer uh, being moved to some uh, band, uh, but still in, you know, present in the room uh, state in the participant list. So they're, they're still reflected, they're, they're still known about by the room until their devices are removed. <clears throat> but at the same point, the, um, the servers can stage uh, MLS proposals to remove the, the user's devices that have to be committed before anything else, anything else happens in the room. Um, so basically, the, the server would um, move the users. At, you know, when that ban event happens, the server would use, move the user into a, a state where they couldn't do anything anymore, um, but were still present, uh, you know, present for, for bookkeeping purposes, um, and then require the, the corresponding uh, MLS operations to happen before anything else happens in the room. Let me just see if I can restate what you just said just in terms of these yeah. three boxes. Um, so um, in this case, um, when I am banned from the room, I am removed from the green box effectively or marked in the green box as, as defunct. Um, and, um, and then they stage a, uh, um, and, and, then, and then they stage uh, an MLS commit that removes me. Um, and then once that commit has been accepted into the group, then, um, then they remove the participant list, and then I'm removed from the green box as well. And then, and then probably I'm removed from the green box, and the wall is empty, not 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 banned. Is that what you had in mind? Yeah, correct. Uh, okay. Um, I, yeah, I, think I mean, much like in the ad case, you are added to the participant list before you have any clients, and then you're added, you, you add clients, and and then that all gets confirmed. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, uh, well, no, I actually that, that surprises me that you said that because um because uh, I thought I thought what you would say would be that I'm added to the green box before I have any clients, and then I'm added to the MLS group, and then I'm added to the participant list. Because uh, I thought you were saying that the, the participant list had to lag the MLS group, not lead it. So No, no, um, participant list le leads the MLS group. Um, okay. So, but, so, uh, so, well, yeah. It, see what I mean? Leads, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it leads in the add case and trails in the remove case. Because, the, the uh, again, we, we have scope, so, you know, in, narrowing scoping here because... Uh, the clients have to, the clients owners have to be in the participant list before they, you know, if a client is, you know, I'm just trying to think of the implication there. I was like, a client can only be in the MLS group if it's participant in the participant list. So you have these like two phase strategies what? before where the, the, yeah, in the ad direction, you have to be in the participant list before a client joins the group. And the reverse order of operations when when you leave. Right, right. So I think so I think the implicature is the thing you just said, which is that you can't be in the MLS group unless you're in the participant list. Um, yeah. um, uh, um, um, but like, it's not a matter of order of operations. It's a matter. It's a matter of um, of containment. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I think that's the best idea, but like, um, I'll think about it a little bit. But I think I think we and I now understand we have in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Ron. Yeah. Um, so in my mental model, the, any per user state is actually kind of restricted to the pink box. So there's like, you know, just one little aspect there. Um, but 
it's possible that you could be listed in the participant list as banned. And there are still some places where you could still be a client in the MLS group, but you'd be, ba you'd be banned in the process of being removed while you're waiting for proposals to be committed. That's, that's okay. That's just sort of a side effect of how those protocols work. So I, that's okay. All right, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, order of operations, we already touched on this. Um, thanks for fast forwarding. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we are, we're approaching this. this. This is the first new slide since the last interim. Um, so one of the things the, the design team's been kicking around a whole bunch is how do we get the right kind of Lego bricks, um, right? Um, and you know, pieces that have a clear interface where we can swap out some implementations if we need to, um, you know, the, the, at least the clear, clear bounding lines and interfaces to, that let us modularize the system a little bit. Um, and these are the kind of uh, you know, breakpoints we came up with. So, so the you'll notice the three middle tier right hand boxes um, correspond to those types of state we were talking about. So we have kind of sub protocols dealing with the three different uh, elements of the state um, that were on the previous slide. So, you know, some um, policy uh, protocol that describes the authorization policy and manages it. Signaling protocol. To control the participant list and an end to end encryption management protocol uh, to control the MLS group. So we kind of have uh, state control protocols that correspond to the bits of state. And then, of course, there's a message protection protocol that describes how both uh, the, the actual messages that people, it's users, send um, and some of the signaling messages, you know, the, the messages for these control sub protocols uh, get protected on the wire and a transport framework for physically sending them around. Next slide, please. And drum roll, this is how the current document set maps all this. So the architecture defines how everything fits together. We have the content format that we've already adopted. And then the thing that we've, we've kind of consolidated on uh, since the last interim is these two documents at the bottom. So we have uh, the Mimi protocol document um, that uh, describes the control protocol, the non cryptographic control protocol. So how we talk about who's in the room, how they're authorized and how all these events get uh, put together. And then a protocol that this uh, document that describes the cryptographic bits of the protocol. Um, how, um, how devices are, are, you know, how commits and proposals are, are managed in the, in the protocol and um, you know, how, how messages are protected as they go around. So this, this should be your kind of map for the rest of the session um, because that, these are the documents we're gonna be talking about. So the idea is that for the most part, you have you know, up down links here where um, the application logic is controlling the room state. The room state is uh, coordinated over the transport. Um, I think the only kind of deviation from that is that there is a little bit of east-west thing going over to the um, message uh, message protection protocol from, from the, the control protocols, but um, it's not too big of a deviation. Um, so yeah, th th this is just sort of your, your reminder of where we've gotten over the last few interims and uh, your guide for the rest of the session. That's all I have. So thank you, Richard. In the last interim, we had talked about um, more of a consolidation in the documents than what is shown here. So is is this kind of what the design team has settled resettled on again? Like you'd rather keep these, well, content was always separate, but the the other three, you you all agree you want to keep them separate. And in terms of like calling for adoption at some point in the future, you want them to be separate. Yeah, so, so the design team talked about this um, a fair bit, actually. Um, the feeling, and yeah, this is kind of where we, we came down. Um, the architecture, so, so keeping the, the content and architecture separate, I think was just sort of a, um, it seemed a little more natural. The content format's already adopted. The architecture is fairly different from protocol documents, so that, that seems sensible. Um, in principle, one could converge the delivery service and pro, uh, uh, Mimi protocol drafts. Um, the feeling there was that there, there was some interest um, that, that folks had heard in reusing this delivery service in some other contexts. Um, and so it was it, um, it simplified some things to, to have it separate and also um, kind of helped clarify 
uh, I think when we started doing some actual engineering, helped clarify what the interface needed to be between the crypto bits and the non-crypto bits. So actually having things as, as separate documents is a little bit helpful for the engineering. Um, and I, th I think shouldn't confuse the, the reading too much, uh, given that we have kind of a, a pretty clear interface. So, you know, kind of, you can kind of abstract over the crypto and say the crypto is going to do these things um, as you're reading the protocol. Um, so I think this is not too onerous a document set. Um, and so I think we're, we're, what we're hoping to build, build toward is um, adopting this architecture, uh, delivery service, and, and protocol drafts. Okay. Um, if anybody has thoughts on that, now is the time to share them, I think. You have to read the documents first. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, they appeared like a day and a half ago. So like, I'd like to reserve the, I have an opinion after I tend to read them. I don't know what you've been doing okay. for the last day and a half besides reading. These yeah, documents. it was more, I mean, we had this discussion last time before some of these even really, I mean, the protocol document didn't even exist, but there, there seemed to be strong opinions last time about having one well, big I, document. So that's that's why I'm sure. returning well, to the I didn't find what Richard said very persuasive. Um, so, um, but I'm, per, I'm, 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 per, per, I'm reserving judgment for the documents, but like, um, but like uh, a priori, I prefer to have one. So, um, so but I'm putting reserve judgment. Uh, and actually, since you're at the mic, when, when you say one, what would that, that ideal, ideal one giant document include all four of these or no, like, just, just everything the co content, the, all the protocol everything, ones? Everything but content, I think. Um, I think the architecture Perfect. document could be, would be like a preview, you know. Um, oh. So I think content would be separate and everything else would be, um, I mean, I'm open. I mean, I just gonna have to read them, but like, if you just ask, if you ask what operator I think a right document structure is, that's not some. Um, and again, I, 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 I'm only, I'm only the microphone now because this is I speak now or like or, or hold your piece. So, well, yeah, I'm asking because we're going to have presentations on the other ones. And I think people want to have a conversation about adoption. It's very hard to like adopt documents if we're then going to like well, condense them all into one or whatever. So well, that's, I, I'm just trying to sure. like get a sense of, of whether, yeah. whether that's like fair game for the end of today or not. It's not, okay. I mean, it's unreasonable ask for adoption of documents that appeared a day and a half ago. So, um, so like, I, don't, I don't care how much one, two, or 50. That's just not reasonable. <laughs> OK. <laughs> DKG, go ahead. Hi, uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore. So can we go back um, two slides to eight? Right. Um, so my understanding from some discussion on the chat as well is that uh, if an MLS client, uh, in the situation where someone was banned, the situation where Ecker's been violating the terms of service, um, mm -hmm. and he's been banned, and I'm in a group, uh, and I'm sending stuff to the MLS group, my MLS client could eject Ecker from the group with a commit. How does my MLS client know that I'm obliged to eject Ecker from the group? Um, because if I don't eject Ecker from the group, presumably the hub server will block all of the rest of my MLS messages, or drop them, or reject them, or something like that. But I need to, you know, my client needs to know that it needs to eject Ecker from the group. So what's the communi are, are we, where, where are we defining the, the mechanism whereby the hub server communicates with the server that I'm connecting through, which communicates to me that this is the MLS message that I need to, to emit? What's, the, what's, that, what's that channel? Yeah, that is an excellent protocol question. I, I mean, that, that's one of the jobs we need the protocol to do is to communi communicate what, what the client, dear, dear client, Thank, thank you for your submission. Please take this action before we can act on it. And which that, document is that? In, which document that, is that in? That'll be in the protocol, I believe. Um, there, Rowan, I think maybe may have more concrete ideas. So, Rowan, you know, I think you're next up. Yeah. Um, so, in regards to the stack of documents, uh, you know, almost any non-trivial uh, working group uh, is a very likely to have a separate architecture document. And I, I, so like whether we merge DS and protocol or not, like the architecture document really needs to be a separate document. Uh, it has different timelines and different level of detail um, for things like working group less call. So. Um, yeah, regarding your question, I think that would also be in the um, delivery service document that when there is pending things and you send a message that you would actually get a, an error message back. Um, so yeah, it would be both in the protocol and the 
and the DS. Um, but yeah, regarding the documents, so Ecker, um, I know you already voiced that concern uh, at an interim a while ago, and um, that has been brought into the discussion in the design team, and that was discussed quite a bit, uh, particularly regarding uh, merging uh, MIMI protocol and the delivery service. And there are some really good reasons to keep the delivery service separate. Um, and one of them is that it's absolutely generic and specific to MLS only. Um, so you have a, a super clean separation of um, the interface there. Um, the other one is that uh, it can be reused uh, and there's some likelihood that it will be reused in a different context because it actually spans by design the, the whole route between clients and server while Mimi only really just uh, covers server to server. Um, I don't know, Benjamin, if you want to say anything about uh, platforms here. That I keep relaying that information. Now we have the, the OGs here. Sure. Um, uh, I mean, so like that, I, that has some normative force. That doesn't force what you're saying, but I like to read the documents and form an opinion. Um, I guess, but I, um, I, I guess I actually got to talk about this, um, this question about that that DKG is kind of pushing on, which is, um, is that is this uh, regardless of where it appears in documents, the question is. Does this, does this protocol specify the specific mechanics that are followed in the cases we just indicated, right? Namely, so um, so like I heard DKG say, um, you know, I need to, um, so, so, so you, so it was when I floated this like ban case earlier, you said that the, uh, the, 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 the application emits uh, a proposal to, to remove it from movie, right? And, um, and, D, and DKG um, said, I'm supposed to know that I'm supposed to do a commit, right? And like I understand, those can be really, those those two things can be can be true in parallel, right? But yeah, another thing that could happen is a um is one of the group members should be supposed to remove the person from the group, not accepting the proposal, but rather um but rather uh by issuing their own like removal, right? Um, their own proposal commit pair, right? And so um I don't think that's the best best approach, but I, I guess what I'm saying is is like. Do we believe that the, the question for this working group is, are we going to specify the semantic transitions and, and who's responsible for doing what in each of these cases? Or are we leaving it to the application to decide and providing mechanism? Um, and um, uh, uh, and I, I don't know, but like that's actually very important um, that, we, that we come down on. I, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding um, what you're proposing, but I don't really see how we can get a, a, around specifying that. Like it seems like if you, leave different um, applications to interpret these requirements differently, then you don't end up with an interoperable system. So I think we need to have a defined order of operations here um, and a, a defined, defined you know, sequence of protocol actions um, for these cases. Uh, and I tend to lean that way, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm making sure that everyone agrees that what I have to do, right? Um, um, and, so, and so I think that, that if that's what we have to do, then I think we actually have to make um, you know, I, there's a tendency in these protocol design settings to sort of be like, this is one way you could do it and another way you could do it and just persuade yourself that um, that we have enough protocol mechanisms to do it. And MLS is sort of full of that stuff where it's like, you could do X, you could do Y, you could do Z. Um, and that's like, fine, that's, that's great. It's a building block, right? Um, but I'm saying that if what we're doing here is different, then we actually have to, if we're actually have to go through every single um, you know, major scenario flow and ensure that we've defined exactly what's supposed to happen. Um, so um, that, that's like, that, that's like trying to make sure we, we all agree that's the scope of work we're taking on here. Um, and, 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 that, and that does require making, I think, some actual like real decisions on the ones that we were discussing yesterday, Mimi, about like order of operations and what it actually means to be part of a group and like, you know, MLS status versus, um, versus participant status and whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. On, the, on this building block versus super, you know, every, every situation prescribed uh, dichotomy or, or spectrum, um, I think probably the, <clears throat> the invariant that comes to my mind is... Um, I think likely what what I, th I think you'll see in the document now at this point is that um, things are still not s totally prescribed, but um, the the hub can can dictate what's happening in any given situation. So like we have uh, a, build a set of building blocks with some flexibility, but there it's at least clear um, to everyone participating in their room, um, you know which which kind of playbook we're following in this instance. 
even when right. like, there's some flexibility. I, I, I mean, so like, again, I haven't read the document, but like, I mean, to take Jihichi's example, right? Um, you know, I'm, um, you know, the, 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 the writer evicts me from the group at the same time as Jihichi is in the message. Now we have a race condition, right? And mm -hmm. there are a number of things that can happen. Um, one is the provider could just be like, well, I know DKG encrypted the entire group and the keys haven't updated, so I won't forward it to Ecker, but like I'll pass the message through. Another is that it says, actually, no, you gotta like, um, you gotta like, we have a group update, and you have to resend this message. And if it's the second one, then we need a protocol message that says, you need to resend the message after this has happened, right? And so I'm, I'm just, and so I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm just getting like, we have to actually work through each of those cases um, and, and also come down, I think, make some policy decisions around what's going on. Yeah, agreed. I mean, my impression is that to the extent that things are not specified at this point, it's not because people don't want to specify them. It's just because we just haven't done it yet. That's like Great. the vibe that I get. Awesome. <laughs> so. Yeah, I can definitely second that. I mean, um, we try to get something, you know, ready where the design team has, you know, consens consents on. And um, so it might still be rough around the edges and, and bits are missing. But uh, that doesn't mean that, that it won't be there eventually. It only needs to be good enough uh, for adoption, uh, not for last call. Yeah, I'm not going to comment much more, but yeah, I agree. I mean, the current state of the documents is fine. I mean, uh, it, as Rafael discussed, it's, it's nice to have the separation between those, those documents, I think, but I don't have a strong opinion. It's, it, I like the structure right now. I uh, don't see any problem with that. Thanks, Rowan. Are you in the queue or no, you're not in the queue. Okay. Anything else, Richard? That's all I had. Okay. I do have one, one request uh, in re-reviewing right before this. Um, I think we really need one terminology section and if it's going to be an arch or wherever it's going to be. I know there's like separate terminology document, but like there's the terminology between the documents still inconsistent and even the architecture document doesn't, it sort of puts the terms in narrative. I think it would help a lot to have, to add the one terminology section that all the documents are going to refer to someplace. So I don't okay. know if that's yeah. Right. yeah, Travis and I have been working to, to consolidate the terminology into the, into the architecture document. But okay. um, if, you, if you'd like more of a, a glossary style section, I think we can. Yeah, I think it would benefit well. the whole work, the whole effort. Okay. Um, sorry, I just wanted to respond, <clears throat> excuse me, to several of the, the things, the questions or comments about you know, we need to have one exactly one way of doing things. Um, if this were a greenfield protocol, we'd have that luxury, but we're dealing with protocols that are in the wild. We're dealing with user interfaces, which are different. And so we need to support reasonable things that are in the wild. So how can we make this sensible? Uh, the, way is, the way is that we have an authorization policy that describes what the policy actually is, what things you, you are allowed to do and what you're expected to do. And then the clients have, a, have clear guidance about how they can authorize any operation that occurred by somebody else and they know what they're supposed to do. So I think that that gives us the tools that we need to you know, tame the chaos and make this, make this reasonable and doable. And it, it doesn't mean that we need to go tell, you know, we need to go tell, uh, you know, what's up? No, you're not allowed to have your user interface do, the, do this thing the way that you do it now. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't think people are trying to dictate the user interfaces, um, but there is this piece which is undefined that, that doesn't exist in the wild right now, right? Because nobody's doing interop. So I think that that's why people have an opportunity to be more specific. Yeah, I think we're we're creating um, we're creating semantics that will ultimately maybe be exposed by user interface or just by client behavior, right? And and I, I agree with you. We need to think about how we support existing user experience. And thanks for clarifying that you know the Auth Z policy is going to be in this group context extension, and it's a higher level stuff that's brought into MLS. What I don't understand is how is that thing going to change in the MLS group context? if the server is not part of the room. I don't, that's, that's what I'm not understanding. Like, like I'm, I, yeah. when, when Ecker gets banned, sorry, Ecker, uh, <laughs> the, that ha, that, when that happens, the, the, the green box has to mutate. 
right? Yeah. And currently the mutation of that stuff happens by the clients. So if the server is engaged in mutating that state, that's the part that I'm, that I'm missing. Anyway. Yeah, I think Conrad, this is in Conrad's deck. So yeah. Okay. Thanks, Richard. I think we're going to move on to content format. <laughs> Rowan, you're up. Hello, everybody. I'm Rowan. Next slide, please. Setting my timer. OK, uh, so there had not been a ton of comments on this document. We had four open issues at, uh, that I mentioned during the last ITF. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion with, uh, with Andrew from Matrix, and uh, pretty much other than that, crickets. Uh, so what did I do? Um, so uh, the major changes are first regarding uh, attachments. So I was using this message format that was based on, I was using the message external body um, mime type. Uh, and it was kind of weird that we had a like basically a binary protocol where we're using then this like enormous string that needed to be parsed that had all these parameters and didn't actually reflect how modern messengers deal with um, deal with attachments. So I created a new uh, binary format or abstract format um, and discussed about encrypting external content, which is what every major messenger does with external content. Uh, there, were also, there was also some question about the equivalent of content disposition and what's the difference between render and inline. So that was clarified. Um, then um, one, of the, one of the possibly most contentious uh, things that I, that I did that I'm looking forward to some discussion from is about uh, how we handle message IDs. So I had this assumption of sort of an envelope. And so you'd have an inner message that is encrypted and then an outer message that has an envelope and the outer message has a message ID and that you would be able to, you know, at some point clients would be able to compare that the outer message and the inner message there had the same message ID or some some way to correlate between these two. But because we're not, we're only defining client, you know, behavior and end-to-end -end behavior for the MLS layer and the content document and not for anything lower in the stack, that's not really possible for us to, that, that's not in our purview. So what I did instead uh, is I created a, um, a struct for, additional authenticated data inside of an MLS application message where you could, where you would uh, put the message, a copy of the message ID and timestamp that can be, that can be inspected by um, intermediaries and clients would be obliged to verify that these two are the same on receipt. So they would declare foul if there was a problem, uh, if those didn't, didn't match. I'm going to have individual slides for these later. Um, and then uh, let's see, I expanded some discussion about how mentions uh, should work, particularly about confusion attacks. And then finally, I added a last scene field um, basically to create a, um, a, a directed uh, acyclic graph of when messages arrived and what the, what the rough order is. Um, and I have a slide about that. So next slide, please. So um, this binary format, it uses many of the same fields as message external body, but it doesn't have a separate, uh, a separate hash uh, because it assumes that this is gonna have to be encrypted and it would be encrypted using um, uh, the, the client, who sends a message, who wants to send an external con content would encrypt the message and upload it and fill out the, the key and the nonce. 
and any of these, uh, the URL and any of these additional optional fields here, uh, and send this information in this format end to end, and then the receiving client would download this according to their local policy and then decrypt it. Uh, Ecker, do you want to wait for the next slide or do you want, which uh, is- It's about this slide, this topic, I don't know what this says. It's the same topic, but there's more detail about the encryption on the next sure, slide. Sure, I'll wait maybe. Next slide. Okay, so um, the way that this is largely done is people generate an ephemeral symmetric key and a nonce. And then this, uh, this uses RFC 5116. It says you must implement AES 128 GCM. You can use another one, you can use another algorithm that is, uh, that is also IANA registered. And you go and you do that. And uh, it also specifies that for this sort of base implementation, there's no AED for the external content. Um, and Bob's your uncle. Can I see the previous slide, please? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, this is this is this is this is something that people do, and it's got good. Um, um, and I've kind of made this mistake myself. Um, the problem is is that this does not cryptographically bind the content to the message because mm -hmm. anyone who has the key can generate a new body. So you actually do need a hashing. Anyone that has the key can generate. So the point the point the point being. That so just just repeat. Yeah. What you anybody said who has the key, who's the receiver of the message can change the content because they, because they can generate a new perfectly valid AAD encryption. Uh, okay, so they could man in the middle of the, well, they you say man, man in the middle of the, uh, the HTTPS URL. Um, I mean, I mean if, if they, if, or if they have access if they have, to that. If they, if they control, yes, if they control, if they, if they also control that, um, that, that, that example.com storage, right? Um, then, I mean, the point is, the point is breaking the end and integrity guarantees of, of MLS. Right, mm -hmm. because because it's replacing them with the, with the integrity guarantee of HTTPS. Whereas if you have a hash in here, then the, the attacker has the key cannot substitute their own values. Okay, could you please create an issue or send yep. me a no problem. Sh short bit of text? I, it's trivially fixed. It's just it's like it's just it's just like it's it's, it's, just, uh, it's a pitfall of using this AAD. Okay, Conrad. Conrad Kobrok. Um Yeah, two comments maybe on the message ID. Uh, you don't specify how that is. Uh, Computed right in the document. Uh, I do, um, and that's there's another slide on that. Ah, okay. Then I'm waiting for that. Then the other comment is with the encryption algorithm. We might mm -hmm. want to sync that up somehow with uh, the MLS group, or somehow whatever is agreed in the room states, just so that we know that everyone actually supports that. Who's in the group? So otherwise, we run into trouble if anyone just picks their own AAD and so no one supports it. Yeah. So using this particular AAD, AAD goes along with the mandatory to implement uh, Cipher Suite for MLS. So it has the same corresponding AAD. Okay, just because you said they can pick any any AAD from the RFC and should be okay. That that's what I heard at least. Uh, yeah, I mean modulo that do you want to make sure that okay cool that it's implemented? Yes. Daniel Khan Gilmore. So this is a web bug. W which is the. The, the, the bug that, that Becker described or that we do... No, no, concept. this mechanism is the web bug mechanism, right? If I want to see who's participating in this list and where they are on the network, I stand up my server and I tell everybody, here's this image. And because they all promiscuously fetch arbitrary URLs, mm -hmm. then I see their clients appear. You go to the, pre to the previous slide. So uh, I agree. Okay. Uh, That's the plan. <laughs> Sorry, is it different? Is, is it different a from a, from an individual proprietary messenger uh, today? Well, I mean, it depends. It, I mean, it, it depends. Like, I, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Like, if the goal here is to, this is, email clients today avoid fetching external resources for privacy purposes, right? Yeah. So. We're going to go through that whole process again if we do this. So the, been the, there, the, yeah. <laughs> so the, the 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 issue here is, what do you want the messenger behavior to be? Because the look, because right now, like I'm saying, do this according to your local to your local policy. So if your local policy is, I don't ever download images unless the unless someone clicks on the link in the messenger, our messenger implements that. 
our messenger also has a mode where you can go and download an inline image that is stored on, a, on another server. On another server. Right. It happens to be on our own server. And right. we already have the same metadata, so it's... This design know, pattern is, we as protocol developers don't know how to deal with this, so we'll kick it to the user agent. And the user agent doesn't know how to deal with it, so they'll kick it to the user. And, and the, the user, user has no idea what they're being asked, yeah. but they want to see the kittens. The, the administrator does have the ability to set this in many, in, in many cl clients, but I'm going to just say, like, what's your alternative? If you have, if you have a, an alternative that gives us better privacy, that gives the user their kittens, then I'm all don't, ears. Don't I would do, love to implement it. Don't do external content. That's one thing. So that's, that's one option. Don't do external content, right? Or you could have group policies that say don't do external content. Or if you, you could have group policies that say um, you can only do external content uh, at this particular location. So at least we know that the web bug is one centralized web bug for the conversation instead of everybody being able to bug the conversation anywhere. Uh, I don't have great answers here, but I, okay. I'm just observing that what we are doing here is we are recapitulating the web bug arrangement. Okay. And, and, and surveillance architectures will jump on this if they can. Yeah. Okay, so, so wait, stay there, please. So we have the, in draft May group, uh, draft main mini group chat. I like outlined a bunch of a bunch of things that were here. Are a bunch of things we could go and put in a policy document that is that would have been stuff in that green box over on the left of Rich, Richard's three part slide. So those things that you just described, like, please help us define exactly how we want to, you know, what parameters we want in that policy. So we can put that in the protocol document when we define those policies. And then they'll be there. And then we can give reasonable guidance to say, do these things to these fields. And at least we can say, okay, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be going to at least the a domain that already has the information about what users that has some metadata. Or we can put a recommendation you know, use a use a proxy or an onion server or whatever to like, if you're, if you are concerned about this. So, so here, here's an, here's another model mm -hmm. that who already knows the network location of the clients, the local provider of that, their user. home server. Yeah. Right. The hub does not. Correct. And the other participants do not. And that's what, ev what, Everybody except for WebEx does is they load it on the local provider. They, they upload it to the local provider. Okay. So why don't we push these objects to the local providers? Of each of the recipients. Of each of the local providers that are in the room. And then if you want to get that thing, there's a way to query that thing. Instead of putting here, this, what we're saying here is we expect all MLS clients to promiscuously fetch arbitrary network resources from, from we arbitrary don't know who, domains. And we don't know what the policy, what the privacy policies are. Instead, we could say we we recognize that the local client already has this delay, this this uh, relationship of their network location to one of the servers, and we could just say um, external content has to be routed through that local through that home server. Yep. Very good last point. That's exactly what I want to say. We propose that in the attachment draft. I don't know if you read that, uh, Ron. So essentially, it's that the we already have the hub as a coordinator for a number of things. So in a way, it's it makes sense that the hub also coordinates, um, like quotas, how much can be uploaded, etc. Um, routing it via the local provider might make a lot of sense for privacy reasons, but it's it's sort of orthogonal to the fact that at the end of the day, when you download it, you want to download it from the hub or again, root it through your own thing, but the coordination has to happen at the hub level. I, I think that it sounds like we have at least three different models that we could use here. So let's go and have a vigorous discussion about this on the mailing list. <laughs> but I, I think it sounds like, you know, we could do it the way we're doing it, which is whoever uploads it, sticks it on their local server, and then the receivers have to decide whether they're gonna download it or not. We could push it to the hub server, or we could have some way where it's more or less automatically distributed to each of the each of the receiver providers. 
Did I miss any of the possible options here? I'll, I'll, I'll let you come onto the mic for your snarky comment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it seems like we have some early consensus on the fact that we don't want arbitrary URLs. So it's either hub or local provider or combination thereof. Yeah, and then we need to figure out how we know that it is and not that it's not actually arbitrary. Yeah, Colin Jennings. Um, so, so I'm not really commenting on the solutions. Good. I'm just going to talk about requirements slightly on this, which is um, the, the quotas, and, uh, and I saw that, is, is really key. And the problem is, and I suspect you're going to want all of the above, including this, I completely com agree with DKG on all the problems with this, and I hate the stuff where the ITF does the thing of like, we can't solve this problem, so we punt an impossible problem to a group of people that's even less capable of solving us than we are, okay? All of that said. But I think you'll probably end up with that in the end anyway as one of the options. And the reason why is I think that people run a lot of these things. If you make a system that's capable of transferring uh, large files, and by large files I mean the size of a movie, you find that the RIA takes your site off, takes you down. That's it. You'll be turned off. So you have to have, so you either have to say, we aren't going to transfer things that meet that size, um, or we're going to transfer those in a way that we aren't taking off the web when we do it, which it, it turns into one way or another, some form of the privacy problem. Uh, so I think that, you know, obviously different clients and different service providers can make different choices of what they want to do on this, but you end up in this situation where, or I think a lot of people have found themselves in the situation where from a requirements point of view, they can't simultaneously solve the privacy problem and the large file problem simultaneously. Uh, Matthew. Sorry. Um, yeah, just as a data point on this, uh, we've had this um, whole discussion on Matrix over the years and decided not to use any external URLs at all due to the web bug um, risks on it. Um, instead, everything gets cached on your local server. What we've discovered on that is a um, secondary um, problem where anybody can send any URL into a room in order to potentially pa uh, cache particularly unpleasant content on your local server. And so there's almost a separate thing of whether you want to just proxy through for the sake of privacy for your server, which would obviously push uh, away from the idea of proactively pushing out content everywhere, or whether you really even want to cache it on the local server at all, but have um, whichever server whose user posted this in the first place holds the one true copy of that and they almost have the legal liability of what that is and that's who the RIAA goes after or whoever the authority is if that happens to be abusive content. So uh, I think there are patterns where this can work um, and if we had a vigorous discussion on the mailing list I'm pretty confident which one would um, fall out because we've already gone and played the whole thing through. Thanks. Thanks Matt. Uh, yeah, so it's going to make several points. Um, uh, uh, what I said before was you could put it in the blockchain, um, but I didn't mean that. Um, um, I guess first, I think, like, let's not get, the, the, I agree with DKG, this is a problem. Let's not get too excited about the ability to solve it. Um, one form of data I can, after all, send is HTML, which contain embedded image links. And so even if we solve this problem entirely, if you were to send HTML around, which is how the problem happened in email in the first place, right? So, um, so like clients will still have to manage the situation um, in some way, even if we did not provide this feature at all. Um, uh, the second is, um, you know, one has to be a little, a little have a little humility about how much, how much we're going to actually solve the problem, even in this case. Um, and um, in particular, um, you know, the usual thing that the way that, that the usual thing that that um, uh, that web bugs are designed to uh, to deal with is detecting when things have been read. Um, when the message has been read, um, and um, so in this in, in this case, what we're doing is we're substituting the sender of the so that there basically are the way to think about this is there are three groups of people who you might want to deny that information to. Come a little Sorry, bit there are three groups of people you might want to deny that information to. One is the message sender, which is the way email is typically dealt with. Um, the second is the hub. And the third is the um, is the local server, right? The, re the receiver, uh, uh, ultimate receiver, or the re the local sorry, uh, so the receiving the receiving provider. Yeah. So I think um, you know if we if we push it, so so if you, you know so the more you push it away from the initial sender, the more you sort of walk down that chain of who gets to learn about it, right? And so, but even but even in that last case, note that the um, you know that the uh, that the local provider is getting effectively a red receipt for the message. Um, in, in this case. Um, and um, so like even that is not the most best case scenario in the world. Um, 
Uh, so I think I guess what I, what I mean to say is like even if we did exactly as DKG proposes, automatic loading of these messages is still a problem um, because it still leaks, leaks the information we wish were not leaked. And the only way to solve that problem is to have the entire message delivered like in one shot. Well, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're on the same page, but the, but the properties. Jonathan. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Lex. Maybe this is crazy, but I was thinking when I, when you mentioned the model of okay, well. The sender uploads the file to their local hub, and that gets distributed to all the other hubs, and then the clients maybe download it. That sounds an awful lot like a regular MLS message. So what if you just don't have external content at all and just have some way of saying, telling the clients, hey, this MLS message is huge and a movie. Download it if you want. Otherwise, don't. Um, yeah, th there, there are some good reasons why people don't want to send content that large inside of MLS messages regarding the way that messages are tend to be queued. and when offline clients come back online, um, if they have to go and suck down a suck down a movie before they can get the get the call from their boss or the urgent message. Okay. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. I mean, maybe it wouldn't so be exactly. Th a regular this doesn't message. mean that we can't that we can't do more inline content or that yeah, we can't I mean, do I, something. I, I feel, I feel like maybe there's some way of like it's not an absolute giving it the security properties of inline content, even if the Protocol has somebody saying, hey, this is special. We'll only get this if you really need it. Um, feels like it would be better security properties than having the, the, you know, than trying to work around the web, web bug problem. Rafael? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly second what you just said, Ron, because that's fundamentally important. You cannot have large mess messages in a queuing system because smartphones need to be able to download that when the app is in the background possibly over slow connection with very little RAM anyway. So this completely defines on what you can do on a technological level. So it's a completely complete non-starter if there is some back and forth between the client and the server to see how big a message is before you download it, et cetera. So uh, I didn't, I, I understood Jonathan's proposal differently. I think he was not proposing to treat content as a message and thus use the same queuing infrastructure but to replace the generic HTTP fetch here with some sort of fetch through the room thing in Mimi. So you could post content to the room and we get stored in a similar way to other stuff associated to the room. But instead of being delivered actively uh, in queued like messages are, it would be delivered only on request. Um, so basically you swap out HTTP for some Mimi fetch thing. That doesn't seem totally implausible to me. Doesn't sound very great for privacy. I don't know. Um, I mean, well, it's, you it's good for these... privacy in the sense that you, it, it's following the same, it's exposed to the same folks that message patterns are. Um, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's content, as right? Jonathan pointed out, it, it flows through the same set of servers that the messages flow through. The only difference is that you, you would see when someone is awake to fetch it and when they go for it. Um, but it, it, the, it's only exposed to the servers who already know the, the membership of the group. Yeah, but they don't necessarily know the content of that, uh, of that message. Like in my PDF with my legal discussion with my lawyer or something, it's like- uh... Oh yeah, no, I mean, it would be end-to-end -end protected just like messages. It just wouldn't be eagerly delivered. Yeah. So uh, let let's let's get the requirements written down. Let's get the ideas on the list so we can discuss them. But yeah, definitely make sure that you include your you know the the requirements that you're assuming when you when you send your message. That that's going to help a lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Okay. Sharing message ID and timestamp with providers. So um, we've got this MLS additional authenticated data field, AAD. Um, so if we expose a copy of the message ID and the timestamp, um, a local or hub provider could reject a provisional message with timestamp that's too far in the past or in the future. That might, maybe that's you know, more than one hour, maybe that's more than five minutes, whatever. Uh, we could come up with some specific guidance about that. Uh, it might be different for past and future times. Uh, the clients would be primarily responsible for detecting duplicate message IDs. So uh, that's with the caveat that not every client has been in the MLS group for its whole lifetime. And so they can only 
detect duplicate messages during the lifetime that they have been involved, uh, that they've been participants, uh, that they've been members of the MLS group. Um, then the local and hub providers can also reject messages with uh, when they detect that a message ID is, dupl is duplicate, but would not be required to do that because that's hard. Um, and I had a little, you know, little discussion about why in, in my case, I included a provider domain in the, um, in the message ID. So for whomever asked this question, the message ID is a UUID, uh, or it's recommended that it's a UUID. We could make this mandatory, but we do, we do have stuff in the wild where we have different message ID formats. We might want to still allow that, but since this is, we're encrypting a new, um, we, we could go and we could ask, does any provider have a problem if we just make this mandatory a UUID? Eric, you want to comment on the domain part? No, no not necessarily. Um, I want to make sure I understand what the problem statement is first, um, which is why do anything here? Like, why not just, like, why, like, why just do, no, why not just do nothing? And then, well, I'm not sure I disagree with that. I'm trying to understand the problem statement is so I can, we can think of the engineering solution to the problem. Right, so we have, the, so the threat model for uh, duplicate message IDs is that we have, um, so first of all, getting two messages near simultaneously with the same message ID, um, that this, because we use these message IDs in the replaces uh, and the re in reply to uh, fields, this could cause, you know, I, I could get a, I could yeah. have a message that is, that is, uh, you know, it says, yes. uh, it says whatever, and then somebody replies to it, and then somebody sends a new message which has the yeah. the same idea, yeah. right? So Likewise with replaces, I I just replaced a sure. different message. Sure. So I, I guess I, I'm very uncomfortable using IDs that way. The right way to do it is by addressing them via content, which is a hash, um, which is not which removes that problem entirely. Um, uh, and, and then that can be forced entirely in the client and doesn't need any server support at all. So in other words, uh, so the in reply to already has a in reply to hash. Why isn't that enough? Uh, what about replaces? Do we need that for replaces? Yes, that they, uh, yes that's what I'm proposing. Okay. Um, and if, uh, if there is a duplicate message ID, you just detect it and the client says there was something went wrong and they just don't display. Well, I, I, guess, I guess I'm now about to ask why you need message IDs. <laughs> What, so <clears throat> if we assume that the message ID is the hash of the ciphertext of the message and you have a replaces, then the thing that <clears throat> it replaced had one ID and the thing that is doing the replacing has a different ID. And when you reply, you're replying to the most recent ID of that particular message, right? Where, where do we need some non-hash message ID? So right now we do have, it, it's pr a pretty common problem that uh, do do you know whatever like network synchronization that that a a client might get confused and or, or clients do get confused and send basically the same the same exact content uh, and that could be at radically different times. Now, if the 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 timestamp is the timestamp when you're encrypting uh, and they're re-encrypting, then we might be okay, uh, but. We, do, we definitely do have a problem where clients, you know, they, they don't know if they, were, if they sent a message because of some combination of, you know, network status, rebooting, you know, the, the, the operating system killing the process as it, as it was sending in the middle of sending a message. So we do get these duplicate messages. So the, the question is, what do we do about it? If I get two copies of the exact same ciphertext, then I have how the same... far apart in time doesn't matter. It does. If I send a message and it's you know if I get one hours copy later, of the ciphertext twenty four hours after it was sent, mm -hmm. what am I going to do with it? You should throw it away. Okay, and if I get one copy right after it was sent, what do I do with it? I incorporate it. Yeah. Yeah. So if it gets resent, I if I look at if I if I decrypt it and I see the timestamp on the inside of the message. And it doesn't match the current time, I'll throw it away. But you are the receiver, right? Yeah. But you can't tell the difference between a message which was sent late and a message which was received late because it was queued for you because you were offline. 
but that's that all seems okay. I don't understand why I would treat a message yeah. that has this exact same ciphertext, which I hope means it has the exact same clear text. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, no, not quite. Um, but like, let's, 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 let's put a pen, let's put a pin in that. We can solve that problem. <laughs> um, but, the, the key committing, blah blah blah. Right, yeah, but we can fix that problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I still don't understand why we need a message Sorry, ID other out. than the hash of the ciphertext. I, I haven't seen the use case for it yet. So, um, so, so, uh, so I guess, uh, uh, well, I would suggest I think we actually probably need to work through the cases of what we're actually address here, and then like start trying to re try, try and engineer the solution from that, because I think like it's probably a little unclear exactly what we're trying to do, um, and exactly what can go wrong. Um, but DKG, let me give you, let me give you an example of where I think this might be a problem. Um, is if um, what kind of what Rome was saying, where you where the, the user sends a message and then they, and they, they lose state and they're not sure if they have to resend the message, and then you have a different ciphertext, right? And so now you do have an ambiguity problem. Um, I'm not sure that problem is soluble, but like, um, uh, um, but like, uh, anyway, so I think, I think it'd be worth like working through the, trying to write down the use cases because I think uh, I'm not sure this solves the problem. Uh, um, and I'm also on the on, on team like use ciphertext um, um, uh, for this. Okay, um, and then. Uh, uh, in terms of the timestamp, uh, did you want to weigh in, either of you, on? Well, well I'm not sure again what the timestamp is doing. Is mm -hmm. the time, uh, um, um, like, I guess I'm not sure what the timestamp is doing. Yeah, so let, let's, let's just say that in a cooperative environment, that this is the, that this is the, this is the time that the client encrypted the message. And mm -hmm. that, we do need a way to. We do need a way to. Well, I, I will talk about sort order. Actually, yeah. maybe we should. Maybe we should go to the sort order slide and talk. Yeah, about yeah, that, that seems like maybe a place to start. Okay, uh, Jonathan, do you want to comment on this before or after the sort order slide? Wow, Echi, you're already tall. Um, so, just something that was uh, mentioned in chat. Is there a reason we're not saying you must use a key committing AEAD and like then some of these issues just go away? Uh, I mean, MLS uses an AAD. What could you? Could, uh, what property in, do? You, what property are you trying to get here? The the thing uh, that Echo was saying, where uh, you know the message that was resent and it has the same uh, hash, uh, so not the same hash. The same ciphertext, but has a different plain text because you didn't use a key committing AEAD, and the keys have changed because it's now a different epoch. It's not a different epoch. It might be a different generation. Different generation. I like it's as in, it's three days later, and I've suddenly received a message. the The keys uh, might be the keys have changed, um, and so you cannot guarantee that the plain text is the same. If you don't have a key committing AEAD, we'll put the we'll put the use cases on the list. But I would I would suspect that the receiving client cannot tell the difference between that. Um, so we should try to wrap up um, on content format. We're yeah. running a bit over. Um, so let's let's like get through this and sort order and be done. Okay. Let's go to the next one, please. But finish please. like make sure you have the the discussion about key commitment because. In the about, core protocol, about the key commitment, like Jonathan said, because in the core protocol, we don't need it. In the core MLS protocol, it's okay for Tricam to have these kind of problems. It's not okay for the application messages or for the, the rest. Right. Okay. That was a little quiet. Please make sure you send that in the, in the Zulu chat. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the, the thing that I thought was going to be the controversial bullet on this slide was about metadata. <laughs> <laughs> so sort order. Uh, Okay, so this is a requirements question. Is it a requirement that different clients in the same room, they have a consistent render rendering of the sort order? Is this a, a feature that we need in Mimi? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> now, I mean, they're obviously there are, there are a whole class of attacks that can occur based on somebody inserting messages before or after uh, they were actually sent. Colin, did you, you want to comment the on the queue? requirements? Oh, sorry, question? I tried to join the queue, but it failed on me. Matthew? Um, <laughs> but I, I will go behind whoever is in the queue. Okay. okay. I, I was just going to say, like, look, you can't, you, you can't, never mind anything to do with Mimi. You can't have a modern chat application where 
you know, people are typing things rapidly at the same time and people see their, it, obviously people will type things and different things win, but in the end, everybody needs to see the same thing. If I say, let's do blah. And somebody says, yes. And somebody says, no, I mean the opposite of that. And then somebody says, no, like you've got to have the, like you can't have your messages randomly swipping their order between different users. Like there's, there isn't a single application on the market that successfully does that. Alan's shaking his head. So maybe I'm totally wrong. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, I think it's a basic user experience here. We have to have a consistent ordering. Matthew's next. Um, so I've got a data point from Matrix Land where we have gone back and forth on this enormously. At the moment, um, we don't actually have, uh, we basically display messages in the order that they are received by the local server. Um, so it's the opposite of what Cullen just um, proposed. However, there is a consistent ordering if you go back in time. Um, the problem being that if there is a delay on a federated network, what do you do about the old messages that come in? Sometimes it's very confusing to go and put them with the timestamp at the bottom of the page. Sometimes, uh, but it's also weird if they pop up three pages ago and you have to have an arrow that says, oh, there are random old messages going on there. Honestly, it's up in the air for us. Like, we're fiddling with it right now on Matrix Land, and it's really unclear what the correct solution is. I'm going to close the queue, so if you want to comment on this, please get in the queue. Ecker. Yeah. Um, so maybe like just like try to explore the boundaries here. Um, like it's always the case that you can have two people responding to the same message, like as you just indicate here, and then you have to somehow order those messages. And the people, um, so the people who think that it's important to have a consistent order, I'm looking at you, Cullen. Do you think, how do you think the system's supposed to handle that? Is it supposed to arbitrarily pick one? Is it supposed to, like, I'm just like, I'm just trying to understand where we are. I, yeah, I, 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 I think any answer to how that's picked is is totally fine. Like, the, you know, compare the hashes of the two messages, timestamps that are on a common time base. Anything is fine. It doesn't matter how we solve it, but just some way so that everybody sees the same thing. Because when people, you see this all the time in conversations where you type something, yeah, and it's what you typed because somebody else got something in right ahead of you. You look like you're saying something that's you know that shit crazy, right? And then you correct yourself. That's fine. But if it looks fine to you, but other people see you as batshit crazy, that's a problem. Well, well I, I guess so. So, so I'm, I think I'm like sort of with you. But let me just point out that like I'm not sure that 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 that, that cannot be solved entirely the client side. And the reason, um, and the reason is because like there's no consistent view between the clients of anything, right? And so either you have to live with so so you can let, say you lexicographically sort, which is a common thing people say to do, right? Um, then you end up with a situation. Um, where um or um they have a situation where messages come in and like you and like the message reorders they come in which sucks right um you can have timestamps is like one thing people often will do um so I'm just so but I you guess you can't trust the timestamps right exactly so I mean yeah. like um so I just try to figure out where we are on this um right so yeah, but that, but that I, we'll use your partial ordering is my point and and you acknowledge that in the next message in the next point right yes. and so how do you resolve that partial ordering question is I'm just trying to make sure do we think we have to solve that or solve resolving the partial ordering question and uh, making it full ordering so I mean we can take the partial ordering and we can take a, you know we can order by the the hash of the, well, no, of the content well, for that, example, that's or, what, but what I'm saying is right. that produces a very aversive UX experience where the messages reorder as new ones come in. Yes, there's no know? way you as uh, so what I am saying <laughs> is that it is absolutely mandatory to have the the ex user experience that messages reorder as they come in. Okay, that's, and that's I understand what you're why that's negative, okay. but you have to have that. Otherwise, you can't have consistent messages between well, well, different people, I, I guess, or you'd have delayed messages. Well, no, I, I guess I guess I, I do want to suggest there's another way to do this, which you may or may not like, which is to have timestamps assigned at the central server. Um, we don't have, uh, so if you can come up with an, a way to do that in Mimi, um, I'm all ears because right now we don't have a way to get the, anything below the, the MLS messages arrive at the end, at the end client. I don't think I understand that, Max, what we just said. The, 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 you know, Mimi, Mimi protocol, the transport protocol huh. doesn't go to the client. It only goes to the client's provider. So, how would we get that timestamp information yeah, yeah, yeah. to the receiving okay. client? Yeah, that, thank you. I understand your point. Um, that's yeah. a good point. I don't know. Okay. Do we want to do maybe a show of hands about whether people ha want to weigh in on this sort order question? Or I already asked anybody who wants to weigh in to get it to the mic. So, I think okay. you're getting everybody who you wanted to hear from. So, just to summarize the situation here, 
the theoretical situation from information theory point of view is that we have a we have a causal order which is not a total order on the messages from what we want the users to experience we want them to see a full order and we want it to be a uniform full order across all the clients so i don't think so i can i have not even begun to think about what kinds of attacks the server could do if we allow the server to specify the full order that doesn't already exist right like if there, we know that there is no actual full order of the messages. I don't see how we, I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the risks are there. Hey, we hey, may need to hang say- on. I, I think this may be a moot point because of what I just said to Eckert, right? I don't think that anybody has come up with a way that we could get the server to provide us with an, with an order. So if we can't come up with a way to do it, then you don't need to worry about right. whether that's important or not. That's, that, <laughs> that makes the security analysis even easier if we can't do it, great. Um, <laughs> We are talking here about the actual user experience of what the user sees. Our protocol cannot expose a full order of the messages because there is no full order of the messages. There is only a causal order of the messages. So either we're giving user interface guidance that says, if you want to have a compatible thing, this is what your user interface needs to do to render the messages, or we are not giving user interface guidance. And all we can give you from the protocol is the partial causal order and your user interface needs to pick its best way to do it. So I know we don't do user interface here at the IETF, but if what we care about is user experience- We, we do, we do good, give recommendations. Good. I'm, I was saying that to hear the no's, great. Yes, we do so, give recommendations. Okay, so we should give one specific recommendation and say, if you follow this, your client will render things in the way that all the other clients that follow it do. I'm very happy with that, thank you. Yeah, I agree with, with DKG. We have, we have the causal ordering from the protocol already, which is good, so like you never, swap the messages from one client, all right. But uh, the global consistency across all clients is a problem when having some policy is good. One thing I wanted to note is if you could add somewhere missing messages, right? Because at the end of each flight of MLS application messages, if you don't confirm, if each client don't confirm the number of messages that they actually sent, you can miss some messages, right? We have an extension for helping that, but- With app back, you mean? Yeah, with app so Oof. that's Oof. a you that's a discussion right uh, but yeah. i think it's you know if you miss messages it's is it worse or not worse than reordering messages good point okay um you get so you feel like you got what you need on I that think, i think so yeah okay but yeah please either if you got us got an opinion on this please comment on an issue you know, create or comment on an existing issue in the GitHub or make a, make a post on the mailing list. Or, you know, if you want to say something quickly, like on the Zulu, I'm going to harvest all those before, before the end of this meeting. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to have to skip mentions and just, can you just coding. skip it quickly to the next, to the next one? And I'm just going to say that I did make some changes to the, the text about local policy for mentions. If you care about that, please have a look. Um, we can skip that. That's okay. Great. Irrelevant. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Conrad and Travis are up next. Okay. So we have until the end of the session today, and then we have more time on tomorrow as well. So um, take your time. <laughs> okay. Um... So yeah, uh, just to kind of cover briefly what we're going to go through uh, is kind of a almost a recap of what Richard uh, already covered earlier. Um, so kind of uh, what the actual documents are doing uh, more specifically, and then also um, some of the changes that we've made since that last design team thing. So a lot of the agreements that we have are that the signaling should be crypto agnostic. This is largely for on-ramping, but for the IETF purposes, we are focusing on MLS. Um, so the documents are very much written in the MLS uh, language. Um, we also reduced the number of documents. I think we already hashed through that. And uh, yeah, we're just going to recap the Alice and Bob flows. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, uh, these are the four documents that we have at the moment. So we have the Mimi architecture. Um, as already covered, uh, we have the message content, which uh, Rohan just went through. Um, the delivery service, which covers all of the MLS specific components, so key delivery, that sort of uh, aspect. 
And then we have the protocol, which covers all the room level operations. Ecker. So I hate to be nitpicky, but nitpicky, this is important to nitpick. Previous slide, please. So I don't know what agreed upon means. Does it mean you guys or does it mean we all? Uh, this is, as far as I'm aware, consensus based from the design team um, and then with input from, I'll let Richard kind of continue on that. <laughs> this is what we talked about at the interim. Right, that's what I thought. So we did not yeah. agree to correct agnostic. What we agreed was that it should assume MLS, but not like make it impossible these other things. Those are not the same thing at all. Okay. Uh, well uh -huh. I, yeah, I, I think where where the design team has been operating is that the all the documents we write, that are being written by the design team for Mimi are focused on MLS, but trying to have clear interfaces in case one wanted to swap out and try and, and support it otherwise. No, which I think is fine. I thought, but my, but I thought it's how we, how we... It is, but my point is that the design should and should ass simply assume that the functionality of MLS is what we we're basing it on. And... Not and so it's so like there's and so conversations that say, well, protocol blah doesn't have this or out of scope. Yeah, that, like, that's correct. So, I, so we are assuming yeah. the functionality, as you said, we're assuming the functionality of MLS. And if you want to implement it some other how, you have you might have to invent things to flush out. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, those were the, the four documents. Uh, we covered them earlier. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, on the Mimi architecture, um, again, also covered earlier, I thank you, Richard, for going through our slides. Um, and with the, so the Mimi architecture covers all the terminology. We'll get the, the terminology uh, fused there, I guess. Uh, the protocol overview, just general, what all of the documents are trying to do, navigating that sort of aspect. Next slide, please. Um, Mimi delivery service, did you want to go through it? Sure, give a brief overview. Um, uh, as Trevor said, that it's kind of trying to specify the MLS specific bits. Uh, we did a, since the last, um, we talked about the last interim, oh, sorry, the last uh, well, interim, I think, or the last meeting in San Francisco, actually, uh, where the criterion was for this to be a separate document, there should be a clear interface. I think, Echo, you, uh, you mentioned that, uh, so that when you read the, the protocol document, uh, you should have a, you, you should only have to write, you know, read a short section on uh, how the interface looks like with uh, a Mimi DS document. And we kind of put that both in the Mimi DS document and in the protocol document, uh, what it does, and kind of repeat it here a bit. It uh, provides ordering of handshake messages, although that's kind of irrelevant for the, uh, it, it's relevant for MLS, but not necessarily relevant for uh, the uh, Mimi protocol document. It's membership management. We had that on, on Richard's slides already. Um, it goes over the specifics of the proposal commit logic, which uh, are MLS specific, but because of the the, the mechanic kind of uh, leaks into the Mimi protocol document because it's uh, important. Uh, and we've already talked about the relations between the participants list and the membership list of the clients. So the proposal commit kind of paradigm uh, influences that a bit. Um, then it talks about MLS specific verification that includes authentication of messages. Um, it's tracking the public group states, so it gives the Mimi protocol kind of this agreed upon membership list and provides assistance for new joiners. And um, it also deals with the download of the pre published key material, which is MLS key packages. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so what we changed since last time, uh, since San Francisco, I think, uh, is um, that we don't, the Mimi DS protocol doesn't specify a specific. Uh, operations, um, add, remove, uh, update, kind of trying to, where we try to provide a clear, simplified interface, but that didn't really, didn't really match what's happening on the Mimi protocol level right now. Um, and so it's just a simple, you know, you can, you can use Mimi DS to propose things, you can use Mimi DS to uh, commit to things, um, and that kind of cleans up the interface to a certain degree. And I guess we'll talk about more when we uh, look at the concrete Alice Bob flow later on. Next slide, please. Can I just see the show of hands how many people have read the Mimi delivery service draft in the room and in the chat? Roughly. <laughs> okay, so that's like maybe 10, um, just so you know who you're talking to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and before you start, I'll just ask for the protocol draft as well. Uh, people could raise your hand if you've read the protocol draft, which was posted very recently. So. 
It's a bit better. Okay. All right. About the same. Thanks. Do you want to take a further yeah. comment? Uh, all right. So for the most of you who haven't read the protocol draft, uh, the the draft covers a lot of the room level operations. So the delivery service covers everything within the MLS group. Um, and then the protocol document is how do you get, say, messages between servers? How do you deal with uh, the concept of users versus clients? Um, how do you make sure that those user clients actually end up in the MLS group? That sort of stuff. Um, so the signaling is based on events. Events is very much the wrong term for what we currently have in that document. Um, we're kind of just deferring the terminology uh, to a to a later change uh, while we kind of focus on the actual uh, mechanics of that draft. So this includes uh, room state changes. So you know, are currently just the participant list, uh, participants being the users themselves. So um, adding Alice, not necessarily Alice's clients, to the room that is a participant. Uh, a member is the clients for that user. Um, the framing is all done through MLS proposals. Um, so you would simply just send an MLS proposal to add Alice, uh, and that gets uh, appropriately authenticated, sent between the relevant servers, and managed by the hub. Um, currently, the assumption is that uh, signaling proposals will take immediate effect on the room state. So adding Alice doesn't have to wait for a commit. Uh, but this is uh, a point of contention that needs uh, further discussion. Um, and then, yeah, uh, the protocol makes use of the MIMI-DS. So all of the commits uh, anchor the room state within the MLS group um, by just nature of committing every so often as needed. And uh, yeah, the some, some of the signaling states, in particularly adding users or inviting users, can happen uh, atomically. Uh, so you can add the user and their clients in the same logical operation without necessarily needing to wait an infinite amount of time for um, the user to be added, then the clients to be added. Ecker. So I'm trying to understand this third bullet on the first, first third sub bullet on the first bullet, because I think it does not agree with what we were discussing earlier, where um, it says sending proposals take effect on the room state immediately, not upon commit. But I understood from Richard that that was not the situation for um, for people being banned from the room. So this is, is effectively saying that with the, in order to get the sort of order of operations here, you do need to have um, like the, the actual room state to take effect because the user is, isn't a client. So the, it, like the user can't commit anything. And so if you want to add that user, their clients can be added at any point later on. And so same thing with leaving. Like we want to remove, the user just wants to self-evict or is evicted through a ban. Uh, their clients need to be removed immediately. Um, the protocol document um, requires that the clients be removed promptly. Um, although, yeah, like it's, it's to sort of allow the room to continue in other aspects without necessarily needing to wait for the user operation to conclude. OK, but that's the opposite of what I understood Richard to be saying 45 minutes ago. Uh, I don't believe so, but I'll let Richard go on. So yeah, well, maybe this is a good time for Richard to chime in. Um, so I, I, I don't think I was being inconsistent with this. Um, I think maybe the thing that the, the picture I, uh, that was maybe missing from my slides is that um, I think what this protocol envisions is basically that the, the hub server has a stack of proposals that represent the delta between the committed state and the, the latest kind of signaling level state that the server uh, is aware of. So like when you are, when, when the user is banned, that user's devices get, uh, it, you know, the removes for that user's devices get added to that stack of proposals. And it's up to the, the hub server to require that stack of proposals to get committed before um, meaningful uh, client actions get done in the room. So, but, but at the same time, you know, the server can uh, enforce stuff based on that uh, stack of proposals um, before some uh, client comes online to commit them. So it, it is true that the, the signal higher, that the higher level than MLS state can run a bit ahead of the MLS state, but that's consistent with the preemption rules where um, the, uh, the MLS state kind of trails and has to be consistent with 
uh, the higher level state. Okay, but this, again, but that's not what I understood the situation to be. What I understood the situation to be earlier was you said that when someone is evicted from the room, they're moved from MLS first, and then they're moved from the, from the higher level state. And now you're telling me the opposite. Um, I, I think this may just be a question of, of what, what states people go into. I think that they, they can immediately go into a, uh, still in the, still someone we're aware of, but, you know, forbidden to do anything, you know, uh, sort of state. So, um, effectively not, not able to participate in their room, but still tracked, uh, well, well, I, I guess, I, I guess, but I think that this like goes back to the conversation we had yesterday, Mimi, but with, about yeah. about the status of the, of the cryptographic state and and users, which are still part of the cryptographic state, but not part of the affirmative state, right? Uh, not part of the apparent state of the user, right? So yeah. I guess, like, like it's, it's like, I'm just fighting for hundred. Well, I, I think that I think that that's why we have this. That, that consistency is why we have this distinction. Well, so but, that, but I, I guess, but I, I guess, someone is, is not removed from the, the visible state before they disappear from the cryptographic state. Okay, but you I mean you had three boxes. You had a authorization box, you had a participant box, and you had a and you, and you had an MLS box. And what I understood the situation to be was that if someone was if someone was in the MLS box, they had to be in the participant box as well. That's what I thought you said. Correct. And, so when I say it takes immediate effect, I don't understand what that means if it doesn't mean the opposite of that. When you said, yeah. So I think I think uh, I'm hearing what the discrepancy is, which is this pro take immediate effect only applies in the add case, but in the remove case that we discussed before, it it was sounding like if if you if the hub receives the the proposal on for the participant list for the participant to be removed before uh, that participant has been removed via an, an MLS commit, it should not take immediate effect because you have to wait for the MLS commit. Okay, but it just says it does. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That This is inconsistent with, with that, that's all. This only applies on the ad side, it doesn't apply on the leave side, so. I think what Alyssa is saying would be correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Great. so the bullet on the slide is not correct. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, Matthew? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question about room state. So it says here that um, room state um, uh, only includes participant list changes. And I'm wondering what the position is um, from everybody here on whether we should be tracking arbitrary um, key value data on rooms, things like the name of the room or the topic of the room or um, not policy information, but just general decoration uh, what the avatar of the room is, that sort of thing. And whether that's just not yet specs and we're focusing um, specifically on participant lists or whether this is meant to be a generic mechanism for handling key value data like that. Yeah, the current draft is very much focusing on the participant list um, because it is the collection of consensus that we have within the design team. Um, other state changes could be applied, uh, say like room name, topic, that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, very much curious as to what the the, the room here and online um, believes is the correct answer there. Thanks. Uh, Richard? Yeah, All right. That, that's still. Uh, so, one, I guess I have my, my fundamental questions here are which of those boxes um, are we looking at that are going to be visible to the servers? Um, are this, will the server be able to see all of the contents of all of those three boxes? Uh, it'll be able to see, like the server should have a consistent state. So state does include all three of the, the boxes, like the, the vertical columns you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Do all the servers? have all of the visibility, the hub server and all of the participating servers can see the contents of all of these pieces. Yeah, so they will have a consistent view of the policy, um, the publicly exposed MLS group state and the um, participant list in particular. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I don't wanna beat the ad remove horse further to death, but it just seems to me like the state needs to be not just, there's there's a band state in the in the green box, 
and there's a um, probationary state in the blue box in the middle. Um, I don't remember the colors of the box anymore. The, the middle box has a probationary state. Band state is in the, in the pink box. In the well, the band state has to be in the authorization. There's an authorization policy, which is where the band has to happen, no? So oh, the, okay. the, yeah, so bands are um, not necessarily part of authorization because uh, the authorization would be, can you send this message, not are you banned? Um, like it's a slightly different question. Uh, so the the membership or the participation states specifically join, ban, um, and remove. Uh, those are considered part of the user participation state. So if you wanted to ban a user, um, the policy or authorization involvement is more on the side of um, ensuring that you as a user have the capability to be able to do that action. Um, we don't have that defined in the protocol document at the moment. Like we don't have our back or anything okay. like that. Uh, but yeah, like it's the, it's very much the idea of. Okay. So we need to yeah. work through those workflows in more detail about what the actual states are that are needed per, per, per user. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they are defined in the document. Yeah. And um, DKG, if I could give you an example of, you know, if, if we assume that the green box says, the, the policy over on the left says that moderators and admins are allowed to ban people, but there's no user specific information in the green box over on the left. And then the pink box says, ah, uh, Daniel has just banned Rowan in the pink box. Uh, if your client, if you did this from a, from a client who's a member, of the of the group, then you could send potentially you could send the proposal removing me from the uh, moving me to band and send a remove proposal to remove all of my clients at the same time. So you could do it simultaneously if you are a, if the the banner is a member of the group. If you're not a member of the group, then MLS doesn't allow us to do anything different. Then you could set, you could send an external proposal saying, please, like, I propose to ban Rowan. The policy of the group would be to com for members to commit pending proposals. They would commit the pending proposal, which would then allow the hub to go and send a, a, a remove. And the hub could already stop filtering, you know, stop sending messages to the banned user at that point or allowing incoming messages. Hope that, I hope that helps. But like trying to make it a little bit more concrete because I think when we're talking about this in the abstract, uh, some of the, some of the, oh, okay, it's like that's a don't care or this works, you know, those, those things kind of get lost. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard any concerns or points raised about the, the sort of room state question that Matthew brought up. Um, so please join the queue if you want to uh, talk about that. Uh, on the event side of things for the protocol document, the mRoom user uh, event, uh, which again, badly named, uh, changes the participant list itself. So this is where you would say, uh, I am inviting this user, I am joining as that user, that sort of stuff. Um, the info includes uh, a, a static amount of information. Um, it's not totally well defined at the moment in the protocol document. We think we need it, but we also think we might not need it. So that there's a good chance that that gets removed at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have all the DS operations, um, namely proposal commit, sending application messages, uh, key package operations, that sort of stuff. Uh, the namespacing here is all over the place. Uh, we uh, we will have to work on that, but for now, um, kind of preemptively kicking that down the road. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, the overall document structure for that protocol document um, is is here. So yeah, we we talk about the framing. We talk about an example flow, uh, simply at or Alice adding Bob, um, just so we have that concrete example uh, that Rohan was mentioning. Um, 
and then yeah, descriptions of what room state events, the actual scheme of all this stuff is, how the cryptographic state is specifically anchored, uh, that's all in there. And then same thing with the user participation, um, namely invite, add, leave, join, uh, and then placeholders for knocking. Uh, the transport here is largely placeholder. Uh, while we use TLS structs for a lot of the stuff, we uh, and the uh, scarily simple REST API, um, there's, there's certainly some more discussion to be had around that. Next slide, please. Your example, she, Alice adds Bob and Kathy and removes Bob. So for those who want to work through the flows, it's, it is getting built out a little bit more than just the simplest one. Yeah. Uh, and I will pass the example flow off to Conrad. All right. So this is essentially like a small variant of the flow that we presented at the last uh, interim. And so it's Alice trying to add Bob. And in the last interim, we had a Alice invites Bob flow, uh, where Alice would first uh, invite Bob as a user to the group, but not add Alice, uh, Bob's client to the group. And then Bob would then go and join the group via an external MLS commit um, after the fact. And in this flow, uh, Alice just um, adds Bob to the group um, using MLS welcome messages. Um, but yeah. so. What we don't do here in the flow is talk about any of the identifier mapping or the consent flow uh, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, just the specifics of the message flow. Yeah, next slide, please. And so before the flow starts, Alice obviously has to create a room. And I think this didn't change from last time. We assume that room creation is a local operation, it doesn't have to be, there's no federation involved. Um, but as soon as um, Alice has created the room and another server, uh, i.e. Bob, gets involved, um, the uh, Alice server becomes the hub for the room. Um, and the initial room states, again, for now, for simplicity, we're only talking about the participant list here, consists of just the participant with, list with just Alice. Uh, yes, next slide, please. And since Alice wants to uh, add Bob's client to the room as well as Bob as the user, Alice first has to fetch key material. And this uh, happens via the DS fetch key packages event that you saw earlier on the slides on the list of events. And so Alice sends the fetch events, uh, fetch event to the hub. Next slide, please. Um, and from there to uh, the, uh, the hub, sends it on to uh, Bob's server. Next slide, please. Um, the communication between the hubs, uh, sorry, between the servers is just as last time as security using transport protocol, which is MTLS. This now lives in the, the protocol document. Uh, next slide, please. And then the uh, next slide, please. It arrives at Bob's server, and Bob's server responds with Bob's key material for uh, Bob's clients. This could be one client, could be multiple clients. And um, then it sends it on to Alice. And now Alice can finally create the add. Next slide, please. Um, to uh, add Bob. And this add consists of, uh, so this is kind of the atomic operation that Travis was uh, talking about earlier. So this is a, a DS commit event. And uh, within the DS commit event, there's an mroom user event. And we can do this kind of event um, uh, stacking or event. Uh, we, we can have the DS commit contain the mroom user event because the mroom user, user event is contained in an MLS proposal. And so the, the MLS commit that's inside the DS commit event just also proposes the addition of Bob to the room, as well as a regular MLS uh, client add. Uh, next slide, please. This gets sent to the hub. Next slide, please. And then the hub already uh, uh, has the whole room, the MLS room state, can update the state, both the participant list, uh, where Bob immediately transitions to the join state, and uh, Bob's client gets added to the list of clients. Next slide, please. This gets uh, transferred to the Bob, to Bob server just as before with the key package uh, request. Next slide, please. And then Bob server is uh, the first place where um, uh, where the the server can do a policy check, evaluate if, if this is actually okay, depending on on the data of the group that the server can uh, look into. Next slide, please. And then this gets forwarded to Bob. And then once Bob has the event, Bob uh, has received the add event. Bob can um, participate in the group and then immediately send messages. And um, yeah, that's that's the result. That's the uh, last slide. 
And just as a note, uh, what we still have to work on a bit, uh, I think Rohan uh, mentioned that, um, is a fan out. So uh, this is a very simple example where, with Alice and Bob, where a fan out doesn't really come into play uh, very much. But as soon as uh, we have um, Alice, Bob, and uh, Charlie, um, if Alice sends a message adding Charlie to the group, Bob will have to receive a different message than uh, Charlie. Uh, and we'll have to talk about that because that differs from the way we've written it up currently. But yeah, I think that was that. Was that. <laughs> Questions on the example? Um, I have a question. Let me go back. Whoa, how is this going to work? Is that looking crazy up there? What is happening? Okay. Well, I don't know what is happening. Oh, Raphael's in the queue. Um, go ahead. I'm going to go back. Not really a question. I just want to say thanks. So um, the design team has done a tremendous amount of work. So it has been a bit of an opaque process by design. And because it was not in the wider uh, working group. So back in San Francisco, we had a lot of dissensus on a number of very fundamental questions. And I feel we are in a very different place now where we discuss some specific questions. Uh, there seems to be way more consensus on, on all the big questions, etc. So yeah, I think uh, that deserved a, a round of applause, especially for Conrad and Travis. Uh, Um, I wanted to ask a terminology question because um, an awful lot of this um, hinges around the idea of events, which um, historically um, have meant something slightly different, or at least people coming from a matrix land will know them to mean something slightly different. A matrix, an event, is something that happens in a room. So it's a message, or it's a um, key value state, or it's a typing notification, or a read receipt, or something like that. So it's basically the, the sort of main um, object primitive for describing communication. Whereas here, it feels as if we're using the word event to almost describe an RPC mechanism of um, uh, a, a method, an operation that one is performing upon the room. And I wanted to get a steer from the working group as a whole on whether event is a good word for that, in which case we stick with it and lean into it, or whether it confuses people and whether I've been brain damaged by Matrix. I, 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 agree. <laughs> I, I agree in some cases it looks very much like a, like a call and uh, like a query and response sort of uh, pattern more than anything else. But I mean, in, in many instances, and this is the case both for the fetch keys as well as the ad that we just saw, it, uh, it goes like through the hub and onto some other server. So it's not just a straight up, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sender and, and recipient flow. There's uh, an intermediary in the middle who does something maybe dependent on the room state or has to look at it. And again, I'm, I'm not super familiar with uh, the way that um, the, the, the matrix uh, terminology and what exactly it means for something to be an event. But to me, at least, it doesn't really feel like, uh, like an RPC call either. But in the end, I guess it's a terminology question. And it is what it is. We just have to figure out what to call it. I mean, for me, it's almost the distinction between sort of um, edge-based signaling and level-based signaling. Are you describing the transition it takes in order to get to a state, or you, are you actually sort of describing that state itself as the sort of main primitive, which is conceptually quite an important thing to get right if people are going to trip over it or not. But then again, events are typically used to des uh, describe the transitions between states. Perhaps this is just me. If anyone is strong for ports, say so. Otherwise, I'm guessing these are going to be called events forevermore. Richard, go ahead. Yeah, I think events may have gotten a little diluted here. And feel free to fix me, Conrad and Travis. Um, event may have gotten diluted to mean more like a uh, like kind of datagram. Um, so it's it's a, a unit of information that, that uh, gets transported in the protocol. Um, and you know, that it has enough information to say what type of, of unit of information it is and the pre prescribed formats. 
and then those units of information might get, to get tied together into things like RPCs. But the the event is uh, the semantic of event is merely a unit that is transported uh, through uh, between the servers. Is that is that about right? Uh, protocol author guys. Um, so my question was going to be, where in this flow does the room policy get set? Uh, I guess in this flow, the room policy would get set by at the point where Alice creates the room. Um, although admittedly, um, and I think this was Raphael alluded to, like we're not at a in a in a place where we call where we. Uh, I think we, we're still working on on figuring out you know terminology and the the basic flows and uh, of course policy is important especially with regard to the discussions we had on which state changes uh, when and uh, which state lags behind it. Um, so that's important to figure out. Um, but in terms of setting or changing policy dynamically in a room, I think for now we assume that's happening in the beginning and then I'm sure there's going to be an event or whatever we want to call it. Uh, that then changes the policy. But I think in, in this example specifically, uh, it's uh, the creation of the group where the policy is set. Okay, so it's prior to this key fetch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, any other comments? Uh, I'll, I'll just note uh, also along your, your lines of the, the policy setting, there's also a notion of uh, that we're going to need to tackle here of consent. Which we haven't tackled in, the, in this in this basic example, um, but uh, Rowan has been keeping us uh, well aware in the design team that we need to we will need to track issues of consents uh, um, in this in this framework. We just haven't quite gotten there yet. Rowan, hi, uh, Rowan May. Um, I'm really curious if maybe we could get a show of hands for do people think that this is going in the right direction. Um, because you know it's kind of we didn't get a lot of feedback from right now from this presentation, and the design team obviously did put in a lot of effort, especially in the last two weeks, to kind of stitch a bunch of things together. So, yeah, I mean, this is kind of maybe. the struggle. The document was published like two days ago, and as we took the show of hands, there's only like ten people who've read it. So, I mean. I would invite those people to come to the mic, <laughs> but I don't think we really, really need to do a show of hands because it's not going to be that meaningful among a group of people who haven't read the document. So anybody who has a has an opinion who hasn't spoken yet, uh, who has read the document, please come up. Yeah, I think the mandate we got last time from the working group was to figure out the, the documents a bit more as well as the basic flows. And so it would be great to get feedback on what we've done over the last few weeks. I know I've already spoken, but I guess I didn't give any feedback on the document um, itself. Plus, I'm also part of the design team, so <laughs> I've already um, given some feedback there. But from my perspective, this is a pretty good um, mix of what we were talking about in San Francisco, where there were two very divergent ways of thinking about this, of the hard-coded um, MLS, um, EMEDS approach at the time, versus the linearized matrix approach that was um, almost at the other extreme of ignoring the MLS specifics and not necessarily making the best use of the primitives that you do get when you have MLS. So I'm, I'm pretty, um, um, uh, what's the right word? Um, enthusiastic, hopeful um, that this is the best of both worlds in that it does provide an on-ramp where people use an existing encryption like the double route shifts or um, I know static key based end to end encryption can basically replace the uh, what we were calling a MLS shaped blob, which is effectively now the Mimi DS interface with something that provides the same interface when plugging either east west or south um, into Mimi protocol. But if you, uh, frankly, it works best by far if you are actually using MLS. And obviously, you can benefit from the MLS proposal and commit mechanisms that we're talking about as the mechanism to go and consistently um, synchronize state across the various different um, servers. And so it's almost a breadcrumb trail. That if you were a big uh, messaging provider today who's got billions of people talking double ratchet, you can start off using um, this at the protocol layer 
as a way of modeling the users and um, modeling policy in future, uh, modeling things like key value and obviously having a common language in the form of um, the content format. And you can replace that crypto block with a whole bunch of legacy double ratchet stuff. However, you would be um, framing things up as MLS commits, which have got um, uh, MLS proposals, I should say, uh, which have kind of placeholder stuff in there for the MLS specific data, which would probably be blank, as I understand it, if you're not yet talking MLS, but it goes and increasingly encourages you to convert on MLS in the longer term. So that was my big concern in San Francisco, that we were ending up basically um, uh, hard coding everything completely to MLS in a way that would not get uptake in the real world. Whereas here, I think we've got this two layer strategy, which allows the protocol to apply to the systems right now that you would be able to bridge from an existing system like Matrix or XMPP or you know, whatever big messaging provider into this as a common language and then down the road converge on MLS as the scalable standards-based um, end-to-end encryption blob too. Sorry for filibustering, but that's basically where I'm at. Thanks, Alan. Alan Durek. Uh, uh, so generally uh, agree with uh, Matthew that uh, step in the right direction. Uh, Can you get closer to the microphone? Yes. It's for the tour people. I'm still growing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, ge generally uh, happy with uh, the progress, especially uh, last last uh, two weeks. So uh, as Rafael said, a thumbs up uh, to uh, uh, especially uh, uh, those two guys, those two gentlemen. There uh, uh, was was really um, very worried uh, after San Francisco because uh, it looked really horrible at that point uh, in time, and uh, it continued uh, then for the weeks. Um, so I think uh, definitely a, a step in the right direction, uh, uh, though um, we still have quite a bit uh, to finalize. There were the parts that uh, need to be finalized. Uh, uh, we need also to be careful uh, that uh, we do not compromise too much on MLS related uh, parts for the benefits of something that may be with a double ratchet uh, very important because those guys that are using double ratchet and th that uh, want to interoperate with a double ratchet in most of the cases, they don't care about ITF uh, or they don't care even about interoperability. We know why they are kind of looking into it. So with, uh, with this one, we'd just like uh, to conclude there, like thumbs up guys uh, for the work done uh, so far with the parts that uh, we need uh, to finalize. Uh, uh, we need to be careful uh, and uh, keep in mind that saying, uh, if you want to be everything for everyone, you risk being nothing for no one. So, thanks, Rafael. Yeah. <clears throat> also, just to reiterate on these closing remarks, um, and just going to say very obvious stuff. So, in San Francisco, as Alan just said, um, the situation was not looking that great, and then this design team was formed ad hoc, more or less, and tasked with. Uh, resolving all these issues and in my mind that has happened so we are at a state um, where there's consensus among the design team that we have you know the basis to continue iterating on more specific questions um, obviously there are many open questions but that is fine um, and so to, to put it very bluntly um, this is heading in the right direction to have a concrete proposal for adoption we've named the documents we have the basis there. Um, there isn't anything that is super contentious in the documents right now. There are open questions, but not uh, points of contention uh, any longer. So in case that wasn't obvious, I just wanted to state that. Thanks. Um, just since you were in the queue before, I'm going to like take two minutes to figure out the next steps, if that's OK. Um, and then if we have time, we can come back. Um, so. Uh, it would be great to get to a point where the working group could consider adoption of something here. Um, 
And I'm wondering, since this seems to be kind of driven by the interim schedule and giving people deadlines to, to um, rev the documents, uh, what seems reasonable to the people on the design team as far as, let's say, if we wanted to have an interim first week of December, can you get your next rev of these documents done a week in advance of that to give people time? Do you want to do that on the basis of this set and just give people more time since a lot of people didn't get time to read these before this meeting? Like, what do you want to do as far as driving towards an adoption decision? Richard, go ahead. Uh, I didn't quite have a concrete suggestion yet. I, and I think that there's a little bit of a question of how mature we want things to be before we adopt them. I think we have enough in the documents right now to kind of articulate direction, um, but it's it's a little bit of still still a little starting in terms of, of the technical content. Um, so I, I think we could probably go to an adoption call with the documents that we have now, if folks are comfortable, mainly in terms of uh, adopting in terms of establishing direction. Um, but I, I, it seems like with another couple of weeks, we could probably get a little bit more technical content, maybe build a little more confidence. So it's, it's kind of up to what folks are looking for in the adoption. So does that imply document updates or no document updates? I mean, personally, I would probably go, um, go ahead and adopt without document updates. Um, but I, I think a little bit more feedback from the working group uh, would, be, would be helpful before we you know, kind of make that final decision. Okay, that's helpful for Tim and I. Go ahead, Matthew, you're the last word. No, I just wanted to respond to Alan's point earlier about the risk of being all things to all people and the fact that the MLS sort of good stuff might get diluted by trying to um, support people who aren't on MLS today. We, we do have concrete data points. The folk who aren't yet on MLS, uh, would, well, basically you're right that they wouldn't necessarily follow an IETF standard for the sake of it, which is why the onus is almost on us to provide the breadcrumb trail and on-ramp that encourages them into the process here in order to speak the common language. I think we've got the right balance here um, without compromising on the MLS side, but we also have concrete data points that this approach can bridge through to DR successfully and that the strategy um, seems to be working. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you both. Um, thanks everyone for your engagement and we'll see you tomorrow where we're going to talk mostly about discovery and maybe Rowan will bring back a couple of your, if you want to talk about mentions and encoding in more depth, we can do that tomorrow too. We have time. Yeah. If there's, if there's interest. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for taking notes. Yeah, um, Tim, Tim was online, um, so we were chatting in the background. All right. So I feel bad for him. He like stayed so late and yeah. did not speak. I don't know. I didn't really speak. It's pretty late here. Every time anybody said AAD, I heard AAD and thought I was about to catch, up, <laughs> catch a work I have. Nope, nothing for you yeah, not yet. yet. <laughs> I just, um, you still got sorry. You still have like. 20 documents and with like as possible candidates. It's amazing how much how many people want to contribute. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, but then when we like ask them to force the other until we have a meeting, it's really weird.